Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. This person has been a mentor of mine personally, as well as a friend for over two decades. Dr. Daryl Kipke is currently the CEO and Managing Director of the NEL Group Incorporated and NeuroNexus Incorporated. He is an accomplished engineer, scientist, and entrepreneur with over 30 years of experience working in the frontiers of neurotechnology. Dr. Kipke received his PhD in bioengineering from the University of Michigan in 1991. He then joined bioengineering faculty at Arizona State University as an assistant professor. In 2001, Dr. Kipke moved, moved his research group from the University of Michigan to the University of Michigan to join the biomedical engineering faculty and to establish the neural engineering laboratory. While at Michigan, Dr. Kipke also served as the director of the Center for Neural Communication Technology. NIH National Biotechnology Research Center. Dr. Kipke's research is centered on developing advanced and planable neural interface devices and systems that directly communicate electrically, chemically, or optically with precisely targeting regions of the brain, spinal cord, neural axis, and heart. Both Dr. Kipke's former academic research group and NeuroNexus are internationally recognized in the neural interfaces technologies and neural engineering. He advised more than 25 doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom are now leaders in the biomedical engineering and neuroscience communities. Dr. Kipke has over 225 scientific publications and over 35 patents. He is a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Dr. Kipke, we welcome you to this symposium. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you for the opportunity to talk in this Neurotechnology Symposium. My talk's gonna focus on neural interface systems. These are the systems that are used to directly communicate to the brain, to record or read, and or to, to stimulate or write uh, information directly to particular neural circuits uh, in highly targeted areas of the brain. Now these systems can be used also in the periphery uh, and the autonomic nervous system uh, and even some uh, end organs like the heart, as you'll see. I'm gonna talk about neural probe technologies. Neural probes are the devices, typically pretty small, that are placed on or implanted in the brain to transduce the neural activity. I'm also gonna be talking about the uh, instrumentation and, and analytics components of the neural interface system uh, that is required in order for the probes to be used. We're in a very interesting spot in neurotechnology where the advances in probes and neural interfacing and in neuroscience are really pushing uh, the envelope into the systems and we have an opportunity to, to use uh, some of the advances in information technologies and associated areas to really advance the state of the art of neural interfacing to address some of the emerging critical problems. So 20 years or so ago in my academic research talks, I, I often started my talks with this quote from Dr. Arthur Kaplan, a leading bioethicist who is now at NYU. In addition to being struck by his visionary perspective of neurotechnology, I was also impressed by the fact that I read this quote in the local newspaper. At that point of time, the, while there was growing enthusiasm and, and uh, work in this area of neurotechnologies, uh, the discussions typically didn't extend too far beyond the relatively small research community of people doing the work, uh, including neuroscientists and biomedical engineers and electrical engineers and materials folks. So what are neural probes and neural interfaces? So consider the problem of, of interfacing with a small patch of uh, motor area of the cerebral cortex, say a millimeter on a side and a, and a couple of millimeters thick. The neural probe is the device to create that interface. And so in this schematic illustration, the neural probe is the, the element that is in cyan and red with the, the dark circles uh, that is implanted into 
uh, surgically implanted or inserted into the targeted area of the brain of the cerebral cortex in this example. The, in this illustration, the probe has four tines or shanks with each tine having a width about the diameter of a human hair with a thickness much less of that. Each tine, in, again in this example, has uh, several recording sites or an array of recording sites, these black circles. A recording site is a, is a thin disk of metal typically, or it could be a conductive polymer that transduces the electrical activity of the brain, of the, of the nearby brain or the adjacent brain into an electronic signal that is then transmitted through the rest of the neural interface system. The neural interface is the neural pill around this probe extending out in a radius of about uh, 100 to 200 microns, typically, for a microscale neural interface. It could be farther out for larger types of neural interfaces. And the neural interface consists of these sets of neurons and glia and, and vasculature that uh, comprise that, that volume of tissue. The goal of a, of a neural implant or of a, of a probe is to design a probe and implant it such that the recording sites or the electrode sites interface electrically with the target populations of neurons and these uh, represented uh, schematically uh, in this anatomical sketch. The, there are three main questions in neural probe technologies or, or this area of neural technology. The first question is, what is the design space of the probe technology or the group, the family of technologies, and how can you use that design space to design a probe that fits to uh, target the, the uh, neural circuits of interest? And this design space typically includes the dimensions of the probes, how the lengths of the shanks, the the thicknesses, the widths of them, the placements of the recording sites, the materials that are used, and related parameters. The second question is, how does the neural interface respond to the presence of the probe? And when a probe is inserted or implanted into the, neuro, into the brain, it invariably causes damage, and that uh, and, then, and then invariably induces, elicits some degree of reactive tissue response in which, which is entirely natural, in which the brain, the tissue, tries to typically encapsulate the probe and may even go as far as to try to reject it. So the, and the third question is, how do you make a high quality probe that meets the application requirements of the experiment or of the, or of the, the clinical application from the, the family of, of probe technology as of use. So what I've illustrated here is a, a microscale neural interface and it's microscale because of the, the uh, dimensions of the, the elements. Again, these are hair size, uh, uh, tines or, or probe shanks. And so a microscale neural interface has units, has dimensions in the tens or the, the small hundreds of microns typically. The same biophysical principles and the same underlying technologies can be used to make larger types of neural interfaces. For example, uh, uh, interfaces that are designed to record or stimulate from the surface of the brain, such as in the temporal lobe in, in this schematic illustration. In this case, you would use electrode grids, which are thin, often flexible grids with an array of recording sites placed on the bottom side of the grid to record or stimulate the, the brain tissue. Beyond the brain, the similar probe technologies and biophysics concepts uh, can be used to design neural interface systems 
to target areas in the periphery and the, and the autonomic nervous systems and even some end organs. And there's a growing area of research often referred to as bioelectronic medicine that is concerned with developing advanced types of neural interface systems that are able to selectively stimulate or record from autonomic nerves or end organs to provide carefully regulated stimulation to treat chronic diseases or chronic disorders. And this is sometimes referred to as using electrical stimulation as an electroceutical uh, for uh, treatment of chronic diseases. So in our work over the years, we've looked at many aspects of neural probe technologies. Uh, one of our early projects involved developing a MEMS-based uh, neural probe uh, using poly a polymer substrate, so resulting in a flexible probe, but that was still sufficiently stiff and had mechanical properties that could be inserted into the brain. This area of research is, uh, remains very active, and in fact, some of the leading applications requiring microscale neural interfaces are using uh, various types of current and uh, polymer-based neural probes. We also looked at various aspects of the probe architecture and size using both MEMS devices and, and in some cases carbon fibers to understand the effects of architecture and the placement of sites the sizes, the feature sizes of the probes in, as a fun, to how they elicit reactive tissue responses, how we can mitigate or minimize those tissue responses and have a higher likelihood of long-term function. This work is important because it helped to, to pave the way to uh, develop uh, more stealthy probes that uh, elicit less tissue response and uh, could are set up or are well conditioned maybe for longer term performance. Beyond the work in core probe technologies, we did a lot of work in developing techniques and assessments for chronically implanted probes. And this work was important because it led to an understanding that silicon-based neural probes could be used in both acute and chronic settings. And to the point where today, uh, silicon neural probes have become one of the standard types of implantable uh, microelectrode arrays used by tens of thousands of scientists around the world uh, in their their work. We worked on modifications of electrodes to uh, improve performance, including ways to coat uh, electrode sites with uh, conductive polymers, in this example, a conductive polymer called PDOT, to improve the electrical characteristics and, uh, and also improve performance. And we've developed uh, several types of models at various scales and various constructs to both help explain experimental data, both on the probe side and the neural interface side, as well as to help expand and refine the engineering design space of probes. One of our ongoing collaborations is with uh, the neurocardiology group at UCLA to take our design space that we've created in the for neural interfaces and apply it to the cardiac space. So one aspect of this project is to develop grid electrodes that can be placed on the surface of the heart to provide high resolution electrocardiograms of the, of the beating, contracting heart. The 
need for this project was to create a grid that had sufficient flexibility and stretchability such that the elect electrode contacts, these black circles, would remain uh, in place, in their place on the surface of the heart while it's contracting. And thereby, and then the interconnects or the traces between the sites that, that and the substrate between the strides had to be designed to stretch and, and flex in a way to take up the, the strain of the beating heart. So here's a short video uh, illustrating the, the function of that grid electrode on a contracting heart. And you can see the, the complex movement of a, of a heart contraction and how this grid is able to flex and stretch locally in order to maintain the position of the, of the array of recording sites. And again, this grid is, is, it provides high resolution recordings of the electrical activity of the heart that previously were not possible. Also as part of this project, we've developed penetrating probes that can be inserted into the heart wall, even the thickest part of the heart wall, at the bottom of the ventricle, to record electrical activity or chemical sensing uh, at depth in that heart wall. This was an interesting project because it required a way to strengthen a probe to penetrate this very uh, strong muscle and, and put a, uh, an otherwise Fragile, flex, or, uh, fragile thin film array alongside it to do the, uh, the sensing for the functional element. So at this point, I realize that this body of work can be fit to a, a basic operating model. And that operating model has neural interface technologies at the center, and it has three arms. One is the science, uh, and this is both science of the neural interface as well as the science of the, of, the, of the neural system that we're trying to interface with. So we, we have an understanding of what's required to communicate with that neural system. Second component is, is the engineering and design space. Of the, of the probe and of the system. And the third component is manufacturing, commercialization, dissemination, which I haven't really talked about. And what I realize now is that in order for a technology or a device or a platform to really have impact, uh, to really be useful, uh, all three arms of this triad need to be sufficiently developed and to interact in a sufficient way. And a, a deficiency in science or engineering or manufacturing and dissemination can severely impact the overall significance of the, of the device or of the platform. So we fully recognize this model and even though NeuroNexus is a small company, uh, we have really outstanding science teams and engineering teams and manufacturing teams so that we have implemented this model and are able to make families of probes, uh, many, many different types of probes and systems and get them out to researchers around the world. One of the, way we, one of the ways that we measure our, our impact is by uh, the success of the people who use our, our devices in doing their work, their science. And so today at this point, uh, NeuroNexus products and devices are used by uh, tens of thousands of neuroscientists around the world that are publishing uh, results in leading uh, journals. So we take this very seriously. And, it, and we uh, really work hard to optimize our model in order to have uh, as much impact as we can. So up to this point, I've talked about neural probe technologies primarily and the neural interface. But like I said earlier, uh, a probe must be connected to a, an instrumentation and an analytics system 
in order to be used. What I mean by that is that the neural system in, in this schematic block diagram, the goal is to interface with the neural system. And we do that by tapping into neural circuits of that system through a neural, within a neural interface by using probes and or grids appropriately designed and appropriately implanted. These probes and grids are really sensors in the system sense that transduce uh, the measure and the biological signal to an, uh, to an electronic signal for the rest of the system. Other main components of a system are the electronics, uh, computation, and control. Almost all systems have user interfaces of some type, storage of some type, and then for neural interfacing, uh, almost all of them, uh, if not all of them, have uh, some analysis or analytics system to extract information, ultimately knowledge, from the raw neural signals. So as, a, as probes become more advanced uh, and as, it, as just science progresses and as technology progresses, there puts more pressure on the system for, uh, and there are some several emerging critical problems. So the first is handling uh, the increasingly complex and dense data streams and data sets. And so as an example of that, uh, one way to measure or understand advances in probe technology is to simply count the number of recording sites that are used in a, in a probe assembly. And it used to be tens of sites would be, you know, a reasonable probe assembly, then hundreds, and, and well, now today it's in the hundreds range, uh, approaching a thousand. And, but I think in the foreseeable future, we'll be talking about electrode assemblies that have thousands of recording sites or stimulation sites. That translates to increasing density of the data streams and increasing complexity of that data. The systems need to uh, scale to account for that. The uh, second emerging problem is how to manage uh, those complex data streams and monitor those streams in order to maintain sufficient quality control uh, to ensure positive outcomes of the experiment or of the case. There's a lot of information streaming by and more and more information streaming by that the operator needs to get a handle on. And how do they do that? Uh, that's a non-trivial problem. The third problem, emerging problem, actually has been around since the forever, uh, is efficient and timely data analysis to get actionable knowledge from the raw data. I mean, that's just part of science, but as neural probe technologies become more advanced and everything becomes more sophisticated, the, uh, it becomes harder and harder to get that timely analysis of the data. So as an example, the, I'll just go through two back of the envelope kind of calculations to maybe frame the problem is first around data bandwidth and the scale problem. If you consider recording spike activity, which is a, one of the basic use cases of neural, neural interface systems, is with one recording site, uh, with reasonable parameters of a sampling rate of 20 kilohertz and four bytes per sample, that translates to a data stream from that site of 80 kilobytes per second. When you scale to a thousand sites, uh, that of course goes to 80 megabytes per second. And as you integrate that over time, minutes, hours, and days, you, you quickly get up to the terabyte region of data collection. And what it just comes down to is it be, it's becoming easier and easier to collect a huge amount of data. A terabyte of raw neural data is a lot of data. So what do you do with that? If we simply just try to upload it to the cloud and you know, have some cloud solution to analyze the data, just the uploading operation uh, becomes prohibitive. That's just one experiment or uh, one project. If we scale that to a lab level, 
uh, then we're looking at tens of terabytes perhaps per week that be, can be collected and maybe hundreds of terabytes per year at a lab level. At NeuroNexus, we're a commercial company with a global reach. And so we're really interested in scale at international global scale. So at a global level, when we not consider not just one lab or 10 labs, but tens of thousands of labs potentially, then we get up into the exabyte range of raw data of the potential to collect raw data. Uh, and you know, an exabyte is a huge amount of data. To put it in scale to, you know, to even store or maintain an exabyte of data, you're talking about a building uh, of data servers and uh, trillions of dollars of cost. So raw data storage for offline analysis sometime in the future is not a viable solution when we think about scaling. And it's really not useful to stick our head in the sand and try to ignore that issue. Perhaps you could ignore it at the project level, but at a lab or an institute or at a, at a national level or international level, um, it becomes more difficult to ignore. The second problem I want to highlight just with a back of the envelope calculation is the information overload problem. And that, in, that relates to the problem of how does an operator manage this data stream as it's flowing you know, from a brain into say a computer disk um, and to ensure quality control. You know, it makes no sense and no one wants to, to spend hours and days, you know, collecting bad data. And so how can we, with, with uh, complex data streams and, you know, how can we help the operator make sure that they're, uh, that all the dials or turns are set appropriately and, they're, and the data that's being collected is good. So uh, again, back to the envelope calculation, uh, again with the example of recording spike activity. In one recording site, it's, you can uh, typically record from zero to say five neurons. So if we scale that to a thousand sites, we're talking about the range from zero to 5K neurons or so. And um, if we're recording say for an hour, which is pretty realistic, our range of potential spikes, if you just count like how many spikes could we collect, it ranges from zero to tens of millions of spikes. And so how does an operator, uh, again, sort of navigate that huge outcome space? And what I think about is, um, you know, I imagine a student or a postdoc doing their, their project in the lab, and the PI walks in at the end of the day and asks, how'd it go? Um, the, you know, it won't go very far. It won't be very well received if the, if the student or postdoc says, well, you know, I recorded somewhere from zero to 10, 10 or 20 million spikes. Um, and I'll get back to you in a couple of weeks or maybe a couple months as to really what's in that data set I just collected. So we need to, uh, or there's a need as, exper as the neural interfaces become more complex, there's a need to uh, consider human factors engineering into the design and the implementation of neural interfacing systems to ensure that you know, good data is being collected and to, uh, and to help get positive outcomes each and every day, each and every case. So what's the solution? And we have been looking carefully at this problem and uh, we think that we, it's, we look to you know, the broader world for a potential solution by making a smart neural interfacing system. And so I use smart in quotes because that's a, that's a kind of a throwaway term that's not well-defined. 
But in this context, or in our thinking, there's a few primary concepts that relate to a smart neural interfacing system. And the first is to design interactive intuitive UIs that have meaningful model-based views. So what I mean by that, in a, in a typical conventional current recording system, the basic view is a signal trace view where there's a set of traces where this is time on the x-axis, each trace is voltage. Each trace is the, is the extracellular recording or is the, re, the neural signal from a particular electrode site on the probe or the grid. Typically, there's no clear relationship between the ordering of the traces and the spatial positions of the sites, because typically there is poor integration between the probe and the system. Namely, the system doesn't know what probe it's using, therefore it cannot spatially map traces to uh, sites. So one way that we have worked out to begin to solve this problem or address this issue is to develop a probe-centered model in our user interfaces. In this case, we develop a, we implement a model of the probe uh, that's accurate, and then we, uh, and then we allow the user to interact with this model probe to select sites literally by running their cursor um, and then the, uh, the corresponding trace will be color-coded, will light up. And then we can organize, we can sort our sites by various metrics. In this case, they're sorted horizontally so that each color family corresponds to the same overall level or uh, layer of a probe. So when we look at the blue, the family of blue sites, they're all recordings, they're all traces from that level of probe. That's an, it, it seems intuitive, it seems, you know, simple and obvious, and that's actually great. That means it's, you know, it's an elegant model. And also it's really quite useful. Uh, the second model is more sophisticated, but more useful, more interesting is a brain-centered model. In this case, we're taking not only our probe model, but also an anatomically realistic model of the brain. And we're allowing the user to place the probe model in the virtual brain um, so that they can directly visualize where the sites are in, their, in, the, in the relevant area of the brain. And then we, uh, depending on the application, uh, we can, encode uh, information, like in this case, uh, uh, estimated neuron positions and estimated neural activity by placing spheres or, or icons or elements in this uh, virtual neural pill or this virtual neural interface around the probe. And we, this is a, uh, we'll see this in, uh, towards the end of the, the talk, this is a highly interactive 3D view, which I think provides a, really a, a new dimension for viewing data, actionable data in real time, and ultimately being relate, able to relate it back to the raw data. That's always important. So the second concept that we're, uh, is part of our smart system is to integrate analytics at all level to provide actionable diagnostic information and, and data analysis. The uh, example of that uh, is what we call a signal metrics view, which is a dashboard of sorts that again has a probe model, but instead of the icons for the sites representing the sites themselves, uh, the icon size and color uh, encode signal metrics of that site. So in this particular example, that's color code of signal to noise ratio. So this tells the operator at a glance that these sites, the red sites have high signal to noise ratio, the blue sites have lower signal to noise ratio. This is actionable because, you know, depending on the experiment, this could uh, inform the user to lower the sites, for example, 
so that these upper sites are at deeper layers and are able to, are, are recording um, uh, spike activity. So that's the, that's an example of integrating analytics um, to provide actionable information early in the data stream. This is important because, um, you know, again, it, it, it gives a very a relatively easy way for the operator to know if they're dialed in correctly uh, with the probe location or the settings. And um, that's, that's important. So another example of uh, integrated an analytics is, uh, is a, our other more other dashboards. And this is an example of our spike sorting, our real-time spike sorting dashboard, um, which provides in kind of easy, intuitive, easy to understand icon views, provides kind of speedometers or tachometers, dials of, of uh, relative or important metrics related to spike sorting like the yield of the sites, the overall signal noise ratio of the units, uh, overall spike rates, et cetera, at a glance. And so in real-time spike sorting is you have a complex data stream coming in, and if the goal, if the need for the experiment is to say, detect spike activity in one dashboard, uh, this gives the, the operator the ability to monitor the spike activity in that complex data stream in a way that uh, and provide actionable information for that. So this is, you know, a smart neural interface system is, is easy to talk about. It's almost a throwaway term, the smart, you know, everyone wants a smart neural interface system. But, uh, you know, the elements of it, I've, I just went through a few of the uh, conceptual elements that we're aiming for. But really what's very, very important is the approach. You know, how can we go from that concept and then understanding to implementing a, a viable system? What's the approach for that? So our approach is to leverage uh, state-of-the-art information technologies, IT, including software architectures, uh, data science workflows, uh, technology stacks. These, the neural interfacing problem at a system level isn't unique. Um, and the, even if the overall system requirements are, are more niche than, you know, maybe um, other types of systems, when you dive down into the components of the system, you know, there's a lot of commonalities that we can leverage existing uh, very sophisticated IT solutions for. So at the, and also at the architecture level, we can look at the IoT architecture, Internet of Things, as a way to inform us of how to structure uh, our neural interfacing system in a manner that gives us both the performance at the edge, at the brain that we're looking for, as well as a, a structured, scalable approach uh, to uh, support you know, progressive advances in the field. And, and uh, so IoT architecture in this cartoon view, you know, shows some of the major elements. There's smart devices out at the edge. Uh, they could be windmills or fans, or they could be power grids, or they could be uh, cars or thermostats or homes. There's an edge computation layer. That's what this is referred to, computing at the edge or edge computing. And then uh, there's a, what's typically referred to as the cloud layer. And so this is the generalized high level schematic view of internet of things, IoT architecture. What we're uh, working on is, um, developing a neural edge device, uh, which is our neural interface system or the edge component of our neural interface system that conceptually, you know, not literally, but conceptually, you know, brings neural interfacing into as an IOT uh, game, right? So what's this look like uh, in a little bit more detail? So our, 
our system that we're working on is actually a platform. So, and we call it the Sapiens Bioscience Platform. And at the edge is our NeuroEdge device. And it's designed, uh, you know, to, on the, on the distal side, the probes or grids, sensors connect to it. Um, the edge, the primary components of the edge device is this sensor component, the sensor interface, instrumentation. One of the new things over the, the conventional canonical model I described a, a few minutes ago is the integration of edge analytics right into the neural edge system. And then also the expansion of the controller or controlling layer at the edge. Um, the neuro edge device is, is uh, connected to a network. And then on the other side of the network, or also connected to the network, are various types of clients uh, or apps that are designed to communicate and control with the edge device as needed and also to communicate and or control uh, their uh, sibling clients or apps. And so these include user interfaces, uh, visualization clients, uh, exploratory analytics, and et cetera, down to uh, a cloud uh, layer or cloud apps, cloud-based apps. So this system framework um, really, again, was informed uh, by thinking about IoT framework and with these attributes in mind of, you know, I've, I've already discussed several of these, but the one thing I haven't talked about th up to this point, but which is very, very important is cost effectiveness. Um, you know, it makes no sense to make a system like this and not result in a cost effective system because then it would be difficult for people to use. Uh, another important aspect is to balance integration uh, with openness, or actually it's not even a balance, but to combine integration with uh, the ability to have an open system. Because neuroscience uh, is, uh, you know, a characteristic of neuroscience is that it's open, uh, and there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of interactions between groups and between projects and, and experiments are always, experimental setups, rigs are always evolving. And so the system needs to be sufficiently open so you know, it can plug into that ecosystem. At the same time, it needs a high level of integration to allow it to be smart, to know what's connected with it, to know how to communicate, how the different elements communicate. And so uh, that's the balancing that is very important. It's an important design aspect. So let's step through in a few minutes the this Sapiens layout in a little bit more detail uh, to highlight some of the issues. And so from the instrumentation component, this is really the instrumentation layer of our system uh, that interfaces directly to the sensors. Uh, it, kind of turns out that in neural interfacing uh, over the last five, maybe 10 years, there's really been a, a seismic change with the introduction of commercial grade, uh, high quality digitizing head stage ASICs or chips, in particular the Inten digitizing head stage chip, which is significant because it allowed the, uh, uh, a lot of the electronics uh, to be moved and integrated into a chip that could then be packaged kind of closer to the sensor. And there's all sorts of good reasons why, uh, there's all sorts of reasons, technical reasons why that's a good thing, uh, but also it really improves the cost effectiveness of the system. A second uh, advance is just the ongoing development of FPGAs and microcontrollers and kind of related types of electronics embedded in electronics. And F these, these have been around for a long time. Uh, there's nothing particular new about FPGAs or microcontrollers, but they're now at a point uh, where they're 
sufficiently usable and rich enough ecosystem around them to be more readily integrated into a cost-effective neural interface system. And one of the outcomes of that is that it, with these modern, with these uh, chip, uh, more advanced chipsets or new, uh, with these chipsets, and along with lots of other things, then it begins to turn instrumentation into more of a software game than a hardware game. And that's a good thing uh, for uh, scalability and flexibility and cost. And so our instrumentation box is called the SmartBox Pro, as an example. And it has uh, a very nice uh, set of features that result directly from its design and, and in implementation of you know, use, using the appropriate chipsets in the appropriate way. And so this is a, uh, you know, the motherboard of the SmartBox Pro with um, uh, the FPGA underneath this uh, heat sink with active cooling. So it's, I'm illustrating this as an example of uh, really professional grade, you know, cost effective boxes for neural interfacing. So another aspect of the Sapien system at the instrumentation level is the implementation of a virtual instrument model. And that's a software layer that abstracts the, um, the instrument below it, such that everything above the, the, the virtual instrument model doesn't really need to know the, in detail the hardware below it. And that again is a big deal and it helps to transform instrumentation into a software game, primarily from a hardware game. The, the, and a virtual model is enabled by the availability now more ready, readily available and appropriate software architectures and the technology stack. So again, there's maybe nothing uh, especially new about virtual instrumentation models, but the ability to design and implement them using the latest technology stacks and the latest software architecture stacks is uh, more, much more advanced than it was five or 10 years ago. So that results in uh, the Sapien system today supporting or using not only the NeuroNexus SmartBox Pro box, but also uh, the Intan system box, which is a totally separate commercially available system, as well as an open source box from Open eFIS. And from a user point of view, and actually mostly from the, from most of the system point of view, it doesn't matter uh, which hardware box is connected into the system because the instrument has been virtualized. So considering the analytics component, the, we've integrated, or uh, the system diet, the system model integrates uh, 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 in analytics at various, at all levels through the system uh, for various functional requirements, including uh, real time, uh, analytics like digital signal processing, signal conditioning, et cetera, that are in the, the primary data stream, as well as uh, analytics to uh, help provide uh, monitoring of this data stream through calculation of KPIs, key, key performance indicator statistics. And then above that, a uh, level of uh, AI or, or artificial intelligence to help control even the, the neural edge device. And then at the platform level, there are uh, various levels of analytics, both core analytics, for example, spike sorting or CSD calculations, as well as exploratory analytics uh, and AI services. And the, the point here is that the analytics component is well integrated throughout the system and that the, the various components are designed 
specifically to provide the sufficient power for analytics, but also to, uh, to go fast, to uh, help to speed both the workflows and the, you know, the progression of raw data to knowledge. So one of the reasons why this system framework is important is that it provides us a really structured way to scale. So one use case is a single lab or maybe interoperative monitoring, and you could have one system connected to one brain, or you could have multiple systems connected to one brain. And at the, uh, at the system level, it doesn't really matter, and, and it'll all connect together and communicate as needed without putting uh, sufficient extra load on the user or the operator. Another use case is uh, where we are interested in high throughput EFIS or perhaps a patient monitoring networks. In this case, you have many brains you need to monitor maybe with one or more systems. And so again, our, our scalable system framework provides us a structured way to achieve this, you, to configure the system to achieve this, these use cases. So what's this look like today? Um, it's the, uh, we've, we've implemented uh, one app, uh, called Alego, which is focused on data acquisition and, and analytics. And Alego, uh, in terms of this system that I've been describing, consists of the NeuroEdge device as well as uh, these apps or these clients for user interface visualization, core analytics, an interface to Python and MATLAB, as well as uh, uh, data storage. And so what's a Lego look like? Uh, it looks pretty straightforward. It's just, it's, it's just the smart box connected to a host computer through a USB 3 cable. Uh, there are head stages with Intan chips at the end uh, that connect into probes. And then the user runs one application, uh, one user interface that controls the whole system. So underneath the hood, um, you know, what Alego does is implement this uh, configuration of the, of the, from the Sapiens platform. So to give you an example of kind of what it looks like and, and maybe why it's important, the, um, here's the user interface of, of Alego and the, We've loaded the probe model. Uh, right now, the user is uh, deciding how to sort the, the sites by, uh, and here they're sorted by, by depth, and then the traces are mapped, uh, color-coded and mapped uh, according to the, the spatial location of the sites that they're linked to. So that seems, or that is simple and, and it's intuitive, and I think that's part of the elegance and the power. It's like, this is how, to the user, it's like, yeah, this is obvious. Um, the implementation was not obvious, and the, but the user's impression and the, the, their ability to use it is what's important. So uh, another example is the, is the, uh, signal metrics dashboard, which is in the middle, this middle panel. So in this case, we have our probe model and our, and our map traces like before and our scope monitor. But this middle panel is a real-time indication of uh, signal noise ratio uh, of each site. And uh, to give the operator uh, an easy real-time view of the signal quality Again, this seems intuitive, it seems simple, and that's good. That speaks to you know, usefulness and, and elegance. And here's a, uh, the signal metrics panel. Another example of, uh, of the analytics component is the spike sorting dashboard. And again, 
uh, a Lego implements a real-time spike sorter and the dashboard provides the all the information that our operator would need to know to monitor the spike activity to get a pretty good to get a very good quantitative understanding of the degree and the quality of spike activity that it's being recorded the spike dashboard and then finally the the brain model so that's this uh, panel here and you can see the brain model is 3D, it's interactive. Um, the I, the, uh, the detected, in this case, we're representing detected neurons, estimated neurons or units uh, from the real-time spike sorter and we're encoding the instantaneous spike rate by color and we're positioning the estimated neurons by uh, as a function of the sites from which they were recorded. So from my point of view, that I find it interesting that our work in the systems is, can be fit to the same basic operating model that I described previously with neural probes. In this case, it's the system in the center, but there's a science component, there's an engineering component and a manufacturer. As we think about systems and it's primarily software uh, development, you know, the science component is more computer science around identifying patterns and idioms and workflows, computer science and data science that are appropriate for this type of system. The engineering, aspects are identifying the algorithms and the models and the machine learning um, uh, approaches needed to, um, to, to provide the appropriate functionality. And then very importantly, the implementation and deployment uh, map to the manufacturing dissemination. And again, there's a positive feedback uh, of these elements, just like with developing neural probes, and uh, if any one of these components is, is weak or is not well-tuned with the others, then the whole system um, uh, can be dead. The performance of the whole system can be degraded. So I've talked about neural probe technologies, talked and then I've put that in the context of neural interface systems, talked about the some of the emerging problems of systems as technologies advance and as science advances. And it's, I think we're really at an interesting point in time. And it kind of brings me back to this opening quote uh, from Dr. Kaplan. And at this point, uh, we're about 20 years after he, uh, after I saw this in the paper. So we're about 80% of the way to his 25 years and it's kind of interesting, you know, you can cut this in many different ways, but I think in terms of technology and, and maybe even applications, uh, we're probably about 80% of the way to realizing this type of vision. And I think that there's a lot of momentum, a lot of, and I think we're on a very good trajectory uh, going forward as a field, as a neurotechnology field, and in particular a neural interfacing field to, uh, help begin or more fully realizing this, this vision from 20 years ago. So with that, I want to acknowledge my collaborators uh, at NeuroNexus, uh, David Anderson, who was actually my PhD advisor. I've had the great honor to be able to work with him my whole career, as well as, well as my longtime collaborators, uh, Jamie Hetke and Rio Vetter. Also, Chris Freewin and Asiya Kobachi and Alexis Piaz. The, uh, we've had funding uh, from the NIH uh, uh, over the years and including several current grants. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your interest and thank you.